Everton is finally actually being sold. The President's Cup begins today, and we're exploring the history of black quarterbacks with the director of a docuseries on that topic. Plus, Erie County is getting creative as it tries to offload the cost of funding the new Bill Stadium, and the A's begin their final homestand in Oakland. It's Tuesday, September 24th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're breaking down the sale of Everton, a century-old Premier League club with sports broadcaster Ben Jacobs. Kira Dixon joins to delve into the President's Cup and the awkward moment we're at in golf with many top players excluded from the tournament because they signed with Live Golf. We also have Anthony Smith, director of the new docuseries Evolution of the Black Quarterback, on that story and why he told it. We'll also hit some basketball and NFL stories, and I have a few choice words for A's owner John Fisher. First, here are your top headlines. Gonzaga is in talks with the Pac-12, but sources tell front office sports that no deal has been signed. Meanwhile, the Mountain West has already lost four teams to the Pac-12, and they are doing what they can to not lose two more. According to ESPN, the conference is planning to use some of the more than $120 million in exit fees it is receiving from the Pac-12 to guarantee payments to its remaining schools. CBS is reporting that the conference is also pushing for schools to sign a grant of rights, which would tether each team's television rights to the conference's media rights. The Las Vegas Raiders lost in embarrassing fashion to the Andy Dalton-led Carolina Panthers on Sunday in a home opener that fans are hoping to forget. But Vegas head coach Antonio Pierce is going to remember the poor effort of a few players that contributed to the brutal loss. In his presser, Pierce said that there were definitely some individuals that made business decisions. It's unclear exactly what he meant, but he followed up saying that the team would make business decisions going forward as well. Devontae Adams, whose name has been brought up in numerous trade rumors over the past two seasons, said that he was not sure about Pierce's comments. The Raiders head coach also said he was open to a QB change. We'll keep a close eye on the Raiders' active roster going forward. Following in the steps of other power conferences, the Big 12 is launching its own network. However, a key difference from its counterparts in the ACC and Big 10, the Big 12 will use a fast channel, free and ad-supported streaming TV, rather than a traditional broadcast network. It is also the first conference dedicated channel to host 24 hours of dedicated programming, which they say is based in storytelling rather than game production. With five games to go and zero mathematical chance at making the playoffs, the Cincinnati Reds fired their manager, David Bell, who is nearing the end of his sixth season with the team. Bell was extended last year following a red season in which they finished just two games back of the NL wildcard following a 100 loss season in 2022. When asked about the timing of the move, Reds president of baseball operations, Nick Kral, said it was, quote, the best decision to make right now so that the team could meet with everyone and get a weak head start rather than waiting when you know what the decision is going to be. After a year of negotiations, IndyCar has introduced a NASCAR-inspired charter system that guarantees teams entry to most races, except for the iconic Indianapolis 500. The move is meant to promote stability and value for teams, but it notably does not feature the revenue-sharing model used by NASCAR. 10 teams have already been approved for the 25 available charters, and the terms begin immediately. After a months long saga, the sale of Everton FC has been agreed upon. Current owner Farhad Moshiri has confirmed that the Friedkin Group, backed by American billionaire Dan Friedkin, will assume Moshiri's 94% in the team in the next 8 to 12 weeks. We have all the details on that story with Give Me Sports senior football correspondent Ben Jacobs, and that conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by sports broadcaster Ben Jacobs. Welcome, Ben. Good to be back, Owen. How are you? Great. Great to have you on. So Everton is being sold from Farhad Marshiri to a group led by U.S. investor Dan Friedkin. What does this mean for the club? Well, I think the short answer is good news because there was so much instability that there's two kind of parts to this. One is, is it better for Everton to have any buyer and know where they stand and start planning as far as the football, the finances, and their new stadium is concerned. And just settling things will make a big difference because Everton have had a very uncertain summer. And then the second thing is specifically, who are the Freakin group? It's not just Dan Freakin, it's a group. They, of course, own Roma as well. It's another American ownership group in the Premier League. And I think when you look at what they've done at Roma, that's one strategy that has some cultural and almost in football terms, political sensitivities as well. But coming into a Premier League club, it's a very different environment. And I think in many ways, Dan Freakin and his group's mentality and approach to football might be better suited to a Premier League club where you can modernise, where you can be innovative, where you're maybe not even as restricted as in Italy because of the sheer ambition of both Everton Football Club and the Premier League. Whereas at Roma, it's done a certain way. It's harder, obviously, to develop and move out of that iconic stadium. And you're dealing with 
other challenges that maybe don't exist currently at Everton. The thing coming in for Dan Fritkin is one, making sure he's not too late because there's eight to 10 weeks approval. And after that, who knows where Everton will be in and around the festive period. And then there's dealing with all these different inherited debts to first stabilise the club, followed by getting the new stadium built. And if in the short term, the Fritkin group can get through that very perilous path to make sure that Everton's still in business, Everton's still a Premier League club, Everton have their new stadium, Everton have all of their bills paid, essentially, then from there you draw a line under it and it could be a very bright future. So I think this is a good move for the Freaking Group because they can sort of position Roma and Everton next to each other at the top of a multi-club model where two teams are treated as sort of the big fish, if you like, within it. And then from Everton fans' perspective, as I said right at the top, it's just going to be highly beneficial because what's worse almost than having multiple suitors and wondering what direction and debating who's going to be right for the club, what's far more worrying is just having limbo. And there'll be some that see what Freakins may be done at Roma and say, OK, that might not be right for other Everton. There'll be others that are very excited by the possibility. But even worse is just having that stagnant limbo whereby Everton fans and Everton Football Club don't know where they are. They don't know where they're going and they don't even know potentially whether they're going to be in business going forward. So this is good news all round and hopefully it leads to a period of stability. Yeah, and they could certainly use that. And as you alluded to, this is a really high ceiling move for the Friedkin Group. I mean, you know, they're, it's still the Premier League. They have a new stadium. Uh, if they can make some noise here and not get relegated, um, you know, this they, they could get a huge return. What do we know about the sale itself in terms of, of you know, the price? Yeah, the sale itself is complicated. So the simple answer is ballpark between 400 and 500 million English pounds. The complicated aspect is it's really just a series of individual deals with Mashiri, as you'd expect, because it's for his 94.1% of the football club. But to get to that number, there first had to be due diligence from the freaking group, which originally, remember, resulted in them walking away. And in that due diligence, they were not just trying to cut a deal with Mashiri. They were speaking to all of the other lenders to Everton. So effectively, what's happened is that a 500 or so million maximum pound valuation is money to Mashiri plus Mashiri writing off some of the money that he's put into Everton. So the price has dropped over all and Mashiri not really walking away with anything. If you look at his investment in the football club, then you have 200 million English pounds that the Freak King group injected into the club during their first period of exclusivity. And even though they didn't proceed originally, they were always going to either be a lender to Everton or take over the club. And then you might find that that 200 million is eventually converted into equity. But for now, that number is sort of a rolling number because between now and the approval, the freaking group will continue to put money into the club in the next sort of 10 weeks or so to make sure the stadium can be completed and all of the operational costs of the club are covered. So they're actually lending for now Everton even more. Then you have the rights and media funding debt as that company is known, and it will not be paid back immediately, but it's in excess of 200 million English pounds. And again, a separate deal has been done in order to structure that payment plan to eventually wipe that debt. But it's not understood that that will happen overnight. And then you have the most complicated debt of all, if you like, which is effectively 777, who were originally trying to buy Everton, doing almost what the Freaking Group did and lend the club money. And Freaking, by the way, in lending that 200 million, paid off another debt to MSP, plus put money towards the stadium. So that's another lender ticked off. But regarding 777, so they put money into Everton and then saw that asset seized. And now there's a New York court case going on. And another company, and I hope you're staying with me, called Advantage Capital or ACAP, have laid claim to 777 assets. And as a consequence, instead of it being freaking needing to pay back 777 for their original cash injection, Freakin now 
has to deal with ACAP, who effectively have taken over the 777 asset. And to do that, they also have to go back to the New York court and convince them that that deal is appropriate and get it green lighted. So to add everything up, you get a nice simple club valuation of up to 500 million. But when you break it down, it's a series of complicated deals, settlements or write-offs with various lenders, including Mashiri himself, all kind of individually broken up, which therefore means that although the club valuation appears actually quite high, if you compare it to Newcastle United's 305 million sale when PIF bought 80% of the club, along with the Rubin brothers and Amanda Staverley, each part is low, is amended, is negotiated, is written off to get to that total. And that's why it's taken so much time. And that's why in the media, you might not see an overall price because the money sort of is segmented and pertains to different parties, many of which basically just want their money back, having been a historical lender to Everton. Wow, I'm very impressed that you have all that in your head. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a lot, a lot more than just here's the price. Um, what is is Friedkin going to be okay with this? If by the time he gets this team, or you know, shortly thereafter, he's got a Champions League team because Everton started the season with four losses and a draw. They've uh, been very close to the relegation line in recent years. Mm -hmm. There's a pretty decent chance that this is not a Premier League team next year. There is, but as you can imagine, Dan Freakin will be looking at that eventuality throughout all of his talks, really. So not even just now, dating all the way back to the period of exclusivity that he was first in. There was always this possibility that Everton could go down. And that extends, remember, to the build-up to the summer when it was even more of a threat. Because at one point they had a points deduction, financial instability, a stadium that didn't look like it was going to get finished, at least in terms of the funding of it. And as a consequence, you have to adjust the terms and your expectations. Um, it is a little bit risk reward. But I think from Freakin's point of view, this is a long term project. And not only will the approval only take us to the halfway point of the season. So there's still the second half of the season to try and recover. And there's a January window to deal with. But even if the worst happened and Everton were to go down, I think the Freaking Group's perspective is that they're braced for that, not wanting it or planning for it or assuming it because so few games have been played. But if it happens, then you hope that perversely you still go down stronger because you've stabilised the club financially and in their, in their planning, they'll have to have that eventuality in mind. But if you go down and still you're healthier financially and you don't have a points deduction in the EFL and you've got a completed new stadium... Perhaps it's not a disaster. I think the more frustrating thing for the freaking group will just be the fact that they weren't able to get this deal done over the summer. So they didn't have the back end of the summer window, particularly after the so-called PSR deadline, because Everton, like many clubs, were never going to be able to do any business without really selling before the PSR deadline. And they decided they wanted to keep Jared Branthwaite and they didn't want to sell Dominic Calvert-Lewin. So as a consequence, they were very restricted. But once the financial year ends, you say, well, you've got the second half of the summer, you've got January, and you've got the first half of 2025 summer window to try and bring in money. So there is maybe a little bit more flexibility to buy now if you've got that capital and desire and plan. And then maybe somewhere down the line, you resign yourself to the fact that you might have to cash in if you desperately need it, financially speaking, on a Jared Branthwaite or a player of that ilk. But they weren't able to impact the summer. They're not able to do anything now in a formal sense as far as running the club is concerned. So this whole strategy after the approval may not come into play until January or February 2025. And that's the fear. And it means that from a football point of view, the club has to continue as is. And that might help Sean Dyche, for example, who were a new owner to come in as normal succession planning, a normal 100-day review. We saw Chelsea do it. We saw Newcastle do it. We've seen Sir Jim Ratcliffe do it. So every new owner will come in and do a 100-day review of all departments. And Eric Ten Hag passed his review. Maurizio Pochettino, more recently, in an ongoing review a little bit later down the line, failed his review. So not in the sense of they're going to replace Sean Dyche, but 
you would expect them to look at every aspect of the business. And almost nobody is safe until you're in there and you judge them. But now, Daesh won't be replaced in this eight to 10 weeks, probably whatever the results are, because that would ultimately be the older part of Everton who are outgoing and Mashiri doing something before Freakin have come in. So that likely means that Sean Dyche will have until, I would have thought, the festive period at least, if not right up until January, to continue as usual. So not much can change. And I think this is why the Freakin group will want the approval done sooner rather than later and as fast as possible, not because there's any fears that it's going to fail. They wouldn't have issued the statement unless they basically thought that it was all a done deal because they don't want to bring any kind of the fan base but if you look forwards now they're only going to have half a season to try and implement things and that might mean that they don't want to make mid-season changes when maybe they would have done with the infrastructure of the club or the football department of the club if it was perhaps the beginning of the season so this kind of keeps Everton ticking over and takes an element of this season out of the control of the freaking group and they're going to have to plan for that so I think they'd be naive to enter and presume not influencing things that Everton will just be safe. But I suppose the silver lining is just the fact it's so early in the season. And these bits of news can give everyone at the club a boost. So hopefully what will happen now is that everyone will see Everton and feel like the future is safeguarded. The stadium is going to be finished. The players maybe will get a bit of a kick. The football management know that they've got to impress new bosses. And all of that can still lead to a kind of what we would associate with a new managerial spike without the need for a new manager, just because everybody wants to make that first impression on what they know is going to be their new bosses. So hopefully that translates some positive results. And then, as I think we've already alluded to, if they stay up, then add that financial stability in the new stadium and 2025, 2026, even though it may seem a long way away, is a completely fresh dawn. And that point, it could be very rosy as far as Everton's future is concerned. Be interesting to watch. Ben Jacobs, thank you for taking us down this bizarre rabbit hole. And <laughs> thank you for joining us on the show. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Keep up the good work. We'll speak soon. Today, the Oakland A's begin their final home series in the city where they have played since 1968. Their final game in Oakland will be on Thursday afternoon against the Texas Rangers. A's owner, John Fisher, released a statement on Monday thanking the fans and apologizing for not getting a deal done to keep the team in Oakland. Phillies outfielder Nick Castellanos was asked recently what change he would make to MLB, and he said that there should be consequences for owners whose teams are consistently bad. After all, he pointed out, if a player doesn't perform, they'll be out of a job, but owners are owners until they decide to sell. I think that gets at what's been so frustrating about the entire A's saga. In the last decade, the A's have signed exactly one player, Chris Davis, to an extension of any kind, despite having an enviable group of homegrown stars. Since John Fisher took over as owner in 2005, the largest deal that the team has given out was to Ioannis Cespedes for four years, $36 million. That's not Moneyball. That's just being cheap. Even the attempts at getting a new stadium were incompetent. The team wasted years on concepts that were never going to happen, like a move to San Jose or to Laney College in Oakland, which ran into the minor issue of them not having the permission of Laney College. Even in Las Vegas, they claim to have a binding agreement with one site, which they unbound two weeks later, and they still haven't explained how they're going to fund the stadium they say they're going to build, despite being given massive handouts to make it happen. Meanwhile, players have had to deal with a team that is essentially a non-factor as a competitor for their services, and a complete lack of investment in the Oakland Coliseum, which can be an incredible venue when allowed to flourish. And the fans, of course, deserve so much better than this. They have loved this team so much more than the owner, who has not shown the ability to name an A's player on command. Real estate seems to get him more excited than his baseball team. It didn't have to be this way. And if there are consequences for bad owners, it wouldn't. On to cheerier topics. The Indiana Pacers emerged as one of the more exciting teams this past NBA season, beating the Bucks and Knicks en route to the Eastern Conference Finals. However, they were still only the second most popular basketball team in their arena. That distinction belongs to Caitlin Clark and the Indiana Fever. The Pacers were near the bottom of the NBA rankings with an average home attendance of 16,507, while the Fever drew more than 500 people per game over that with an attendance of 17,036. That more than tripled their attendance from last year. Fever road games accounted for every other team's most attended game of the season, and every WNBA team saw at least a 16% increase in average attendance, and the league as a whole saw its attendance grow 48% to 9,807. All that provides good momentum for more teams, but the league might get more aggressive in adding more games to the season. 
Next year, they're going from 40 to 44. But if they see more growth in 2025, they should make sure that they have the supply to meet the demand. They don't want to spread themselves too thin, but getting this right is going to be one of the most important factors in navigating the league's growth. Erie County is asking the public, can you pay my bills? The county is obligated to pay $250 million toward the new Bills Stadium, and they plan to do half of that by issuing bonds. That, of course, spreads the cost of the project over many years, but greatly increases the total amount spent because those bonds come with interest. Now the county is offering the public a way to get in on the other side of that. Starting today, you can purchase the bonds, provided you have at least $5,000 to spend on an investment that will take years to pay back and where you won't know the interest rate until after you buy the bonds. Erie comptroller Kevin Hardwick was playing up the sentimental factor in pitching the investments, telling WKBW that it's an investment opportunity, but it also has an emotional attachment to it. Hopefully, the emotional draw of stadium bonds with an undefined return is not too important a factor here for the county's fiscal health, because if it is, they should not have agreed to this whole thing in the first place. Sticking with football, we mentioned the Panther Raiders game in the headlines, but it was notable for a reason beyond the Raiders' rough performance. It was the first time in NFL history that two teams with female presidents played each other. The Raiders' Sandra Douglas Morgan and the Panthers' Christy Coleman have both led their team since 2022. As we'll discuss from a different angle in the next segment, NFL teams get a big leg up when they stop ignoring half the talent pool. Moments like this are signs that we're moving toward a real meritocracy. Speaking of which, black quarterbacks were a rarity in the NFL for decades, despite many standout performers at the college level. My next guest, Anthony Smith, chronicled that story in his docuseries, Evolution of the Black Quarterback. It's a fascinating, often maddening, but ultimately heartening look at football in America. And our conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by director Anthony Smith. Welcome, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. Uh, so you are the director of a new docuseries called Evolution of the Black Quarterback, hosted by Michael Vick. Why was now the time to tell this story? You know, that's funny. Uh, you know, when we were pitching this project, and even as we've been doing promotion on the project, that's a question that comes up a lot. And our answer is pretty simple, and it's the same answer repeatedly. And it's the fact that this is a perfect time to celebrate how far we've come um, as fans of the NFL, as fans of football, but also as a, as a people here in this country. Um, the fact that we have more black quarterbacks starting um, national football games more than at any time before in history, the fact that there were just two black quarterbacks that started the Super Bowl, it's a moment to celebrate. My mom always used to tell, used to tell me when I was a kid, celebrate your wins. And when we hear about such divisiveness and such, um, just animosity in the country. This is actually a win. This is actually something that shows progress, um, not only in the NFL, but as far as the fans go and as far as just embracing um, this this new brand of quarterback and this new this new style of play. So it's a, so it's a win. It's a perfect time to celebrate. But also, as we celebrate, it's also uh, the perfect time to take a look back and look back at the pioneers that paved the way, that sacrificed, that struggled, that underwent and went through so many difficult things from hate mail, the death threats, so we could be at a place now where, where quarterbacks could play at the highest level, irregardless of race. Yeah, and to get into that history a little bit, I learned a, a ton from the docuseries, um, and pretty much every black quarterback up through at least Warren Moon was like historically significant in some way. What would happen? But there are a lot of um, star black quarterbacks in college, you know, like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, what would typically happen to them as they approach the NFL? So this is crazy. And this is actually one of my biggest surprises that I had and the biggest things that I learned going through this process. Um, I knew that there were guys that were either asked to change positions or had to change positions, but I didn't realize how many had to go through through that experience. Um, and it was a huge surprise all the way up, as you mentioned, through the 1980s where, where Warren Moon had to go to Canada uh, because he wouldn't change positions. Uh, Tony Dungy, who was one of his contemporaries who played college football and played quarterback in college football, changed positions to play in the NFL. And so many quarterbacks of that time had to make that decision, go to Canada or change your position, um, which was really surprising to learn. I mean, one thing that really stuck with me um, in, in the series is, you know, so you know, the host is Michael Vick, of course, and uh, he's 
speaking to quarterbacks, I think in the, is it the 2023 draft and a bunch of them are saying, you know, like we have so much respect for you. You really paved the way for us. I was thinking like Michael Vick is, I don't think of him as someone who like paved the way. Like he's, you know, I feel like the field was pretty well established by the time he got there. But, um, but yeah, w in what way is he kind of, um, uh, someone who, who created a path? So, you know, it's interesting um, because, you know, and again, in having conversations, people have asked, why is Michael Vick the perfect person to, to go on this journey? And what I tell them is that Michael Vick is right smack in the middle of the evolution. When you think about the evolution of the black quarterback, he's somebody that's old enough to have seen the pioneers like Doug Williams, like Warren Moon, like Randall Cunningham. He actually saw them play. He's also young enough for the guys today to have seen him play. Um, when you talk about this evolution, 1978 is a huge year. That's the year that Doug Williams and Warren Moon both leave college. Um, so it's this, this pivotal year. You fast forward 23 years later, that's 2001. Michael Vick becomes the first black quarterback that's drafted number one overall. Uh, said, you know, which is, which is a huge historic landmark. Fast forward 23 years later, it's 2024 and you and me are having this conversation. There's more black quarterbacks playing now than ever. So literally he's right there in the middle. Um, and when you talk about the history before he was drafted number one, there had never been a black quarterback drafted number one overall in the, in the 23 years that have, that have since, uh, since passed, there's been seven. So he opened the floodgates in many ways, his style of play, but also the fact that once Donovan went number two, two years earlier, and he went number one, two years later in 2001. After that, the floodgates opened. That was the point of no return, really. That was the line of demarcation. So that's why you see so many quarterbacks point to Michael Vick as this guy that paved the way, because in, re in reality, that's all they know. They know a world where Michael Vick and later Cam Newton and, and these guys um, played this game at this high level, and it was a normal thing. Um, before that, it wasn't normal. Yeah, and, and of course, now we've had two consecutive years of the top two picks being black quarterbacks. Um, and as just as the docuseries kind of addresses this, I feel like we should address Michael Vick as as a host. Um, obviously, he's had, you know, sort of a, a troubled past with, with dogfighting um, and came back to the league. You know, I, I think a lot of people feel like he's, you know, he, he did his time. He, he yeah. redeemed himself um, or at least, you know, kind of came back around. Um, were there any consternation around around that stuff as, you know, yeah. you selected him as a host? Well, I mean, so a couple of things. I mean, I think Andy Reid, his former coach who's featured in the doc, says it best. You know, Michael paid the piper. You know, he did he did the time, he did the crime. He did the time. And since he since he left and rejoined the league, um, you know, he's been reembraced, reembraced by the NFL. He's on TV, but also he's really concentrated and spent time trying to trying to you know, be a contributor to society. Um, he loves the NFL. He's wanted to be an ambassador for the NFL and, and, and things that, that, that mean a lot to him um, and, and be a force for good. Um, you know, we have, we've had a lot of conversations about that. And we think that this project is just an extension of that. Uh, really wanted to give back. That's one of the things that he, that he talked about when we first started talking about this project is giving back and letting people know that, you know, Black quarterback history didn't start with him, one. Uh, but number two, he just wanted to tell a positive story and and hopefully be a force for for good and to celebrate the the progress that's been made. So um, there, you know, we had conversations and obviously his backstory um, is something that comes up in the doc. You 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 can't run away from 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 your past. Um, um, and this this is a, this is a doc about history, um, but at the same time, we think that. This is an extension of him wanting to wanting to be a force force for good. Um, so so that's why that's why we ultimately uh, had no problem moving forward with him. Feels like the the story has you know a lot of good people and good quarterbacks um, who who had to you know fight their way through through the system, but there aren't really bad guys. They're just sort of like this bad force, you know, yeah. racism essentially. Yeah. Um, was that a conscious choice to not really name and shame specific people? When we went into this and we first said that we wanted to, to tell this story, one of the things that we wanted to do was make sure that this was a celebration. It was a celebration of these great athletes, um, but it was also a celebration of how far we've come. Um, 
there's enough. We feel like there's enough. I feel personally there's enough divisiveness in the in the world, in the country. But also speaking specifically as an African American, as an African American filmmaker, black people on screen often are portrayed as victims of racism, victims of, you know, all of these these negative forces, slavery, et cetera. Um, but this is a story of overcoming the odds. This is a story of people that that put their heads down amidst crazy uh, adversity and, and odds and and pushed pushed kept pushing forward. And then once there once you know one individual's race was over, they handed the baton to the next person and they took up the they took up the mantle. Um, so it's really about it's really a story of of celebration and you know, even though it's called the evolution of the black quarterback, really, it's the evolution of professional football. Um, it's the evolution of where we've come as Americans over the course of the last 40 years, um, where where this is no longer the issue that it was 40 years ago. And granted, things still come up from time to time. Russell Wilson in the doc talks about experiencing racism the week after he won the Super Bowl on a golf course. Um, but it's fewer and far between. Um, you know, players now for the most part, and I would say for the most part, because again, you're never going to completely get rid of something that's plagued this country since the beginning of the country. Um, but we're much better off than we were when you and I were born. And hopefully, you know, our children, it's going to be a better world. And I think that that's, that's progress. Um, you know, we're at, a place, we're at a place now where you're going to just see more and more black quarterbacks and some are going to be good. Some are going to be great. Some are going to be bad, but they're going to get the chance. And that's the, that's the key thing. All you really want in life is a chance. And now you have that chance where 40 years ago, most, most black quarterbacks didn't get the chance. Where does Colin Kaepernick fit into this whole story? So look, you can't tell the story of the evolution of the black quarterback. Um, you can't tell the, tell the story of American history period in the last 20 years without telling the story of Colin Kaepernick. And Colin Kaepernick happens to be a black quarterback, so you have to find a way to include Kaepernick in in this story. Um, you know, we know that Kaepernick doesn't say a lot. He hasn't really spoken in the last six years, um, but we had to at least try to to include his voice in in this doc. And we had planned on finding a way to honor him, assuming that he was going to say no, because again. He, um, he usually declines requests, but when he found out, when Colin found out what he was doing, we sent him a sizzle of, of all of the voices that, that had been included and we had, we had spoken with up to that point. Um, we let him know that Michael was, was a part of it and was going to be the one conducting the conversation. Colin said, let's do it. Come and come, come up to, come up to where I am and let's, let's talk over the course of an afternoon. So. Our very first conversation was was with Cam Newton uh, almost two years ago, and the last one was with Colin a couple months ago. And you know, and where does he see himself in? I don't know. I mean, on one hand, it, it's not he he got he played in the Super Bowl. He was a star quarterback. Um, but yeah, where where does he kind of yeah see himself as you know someone who um, basically had his career ended by because he spoke out? So I think that with Colin, and one of the things that that I believe, and again, not speaking for him, but but just kind of reading between the lines, one of the things that I do think appealed to him about this particular project was the fact that we did not shy away from him. In fact, we wanted to celebrate his football career. Um, you know, everything that he's done since since the last time he took a snap um, has been celebrated and rightfully so. But it's one of those things where I think people often forget about just how great a football player he was. In his first three years as a quarterback, he went to two NFC Championship games and went to a Super Bowl um, and, and, and nearly won that Super Bowl game. So he was an amazing quarterback. Um, and he did some things just as far as the evolution goes from a quarterback position that we're seeing bigger, leaner, taller quarterbacks um, with that arm, but also with that speed. And we're seeing that in the league a lot more and more now where we hadn't necessarily prior to prior to Colin. But when you talk about leadership and the fact that he he you know, you want your quarterbacks to be leaders and he led from the front off the field. 
you can agree with him, you can disagree with him, but you can't say that he didn't lead. You can't say that he didn't stand up for something that he believed in. And, um, and ultimately, that's what you want your leaders to do, whether they're in a football field or in a boardroom. And he did that. So when we talk about the evolution of this position, um, you have to include him because he was a leader on the field where he had great success, but also off the field, he led a, he led a movement. He led a, a, a social justice movement. Um, and you want your quarterbacks to be leaders. So both on and off the field, um, he, he was what, a, what the definition of a quarterback should be and, and is. And in terms of, you know, his legacy, um, you know, one of the things that he told us that, that I thought was very, very interesting, um, he says, you often hear about people doing things the right way. And what does the right way mean? He's like, what is, you know, what is the right way? Is it, is it dressing a certain way? Is it, you know, is it, is it, is it carrying yourself a certain way? Um, and, and his answer on doing things the right way and doing what you believe in um, and being someone that people can look to um, was, was really inspiring hearing his, his thoughts on it. I'm not going to give the full, the full answer, tune into the prime video to watch it. But, um, but I thought that he, um, um, it was very interesting, his thoughts on both his legacy, but also what it means to be a leader and what leadership means. All right. We'll leave it there. The series is evolution of the black quarterback, Anthony Smith. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The President's Cup begins today. These team golf events are often celebrations of the sport and all its talent, but this tournament comes with the backdrop of the slow negotiations between the PGA Tour and Saudi Arabia. I get into all of that and plenty more with my next guest, reporter Kira Dixon, and that's coming up next. I'm joined now by NBC Sports and Golf Channel reporter Kira Dixon. Welcome, Kira. Hi, and thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So we have the President's Cup coming up, it's U.S. against the non-European world. Uh, what would you say are the big narratives <laughs> heading into this tournament in Montreal? I love how you phrase that, the non-European world. Uh, so for those that don't know, the President's Cup they, is the U.S. team competing against the, quote, internationals. Um, and this will be an interesting edition of the President's Cup, especially considering the loss that the Americans had at the Ryder Cup in Rome just last year. Kind of going into that Ryder Cup, I think that everybody had these huge expectations for Team USA. And unfortunately, that didn't work out. Team USA ends up losing to Europe. So now it's almost like Team USA has something to prove in terms of how they make their team picks, how they do their preparation, uh, do the the pairings work, you know, is the data uh, approach that they are taking the correct one. Um, so, so it'll certainly be interesting. I think that um, last time ahead of the Ryder Cup, uh, a lot of Team USA had taken, I think, about five or six weeks off of competition. They hadn't. Uh, that was a, that was a big thing. It was like there wasn't this real prepared narrative. You know, they get there Monday of the week of in Italy. They've got the the time change that they have to make, and all of a sudden it's competition time, and they're just not quite ready. So uh, I think that that has changed ahead of uh, Montreal. You'll see them arriving, I believe, on Saturday. They'll start practicing on Sunday. It's in Canada, so. For most, it's not as much of a, a time change, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then you've also got names like you won't see Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas, I believe, for the first time in eight years. They've been stalwarts of, of these teams. Um, Jordan is out. Uh, he's going to be out with an injury. He's getting uh, wrist surgery or maybe already had it, uh, but he he's injured. Um, Justin Thomas had a great season, but... Uh, that didn't warrant him a captain's pick. It seems like Captain Jim Furyk really just went down the the leaderboard in terms of the the points. You know, the first, the top six automatically qualify. The last, uh, and then after that, you can have captain's picks. And it seems like Jim, Captain Jim Furyk, went uh, just seven through twelve for those other six picks. Um, and then if you, I mean, we, there's, there's a bajillion storylines. <laughs> we could do this forever, but, but if you look at, yeah, if you look at the internationals, uh, um, you know, they, they're in terms of their world rankings, they're certainly not as high as team USA, but they've got a lot of things going in their favor. First of all, they, they're on, you know, quote home soil. They've got kind of like a home game atmosphere going on with the, the they've got three Canadians on the teams, of course, captain Mike Weir. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. They've got some really big personalities like Tom Kim, um, 
uh, who's playing in his second President's Cup. You've got uh, Min Woo Lee, who's making his President's Cup debut. And for those don't, that don't know who Min Woo Lee is, he's, I recommend you look him up. He's uh, got this really big personality. He's known as the chef. You'll hear lots of people screaming, let him cook. Uh, so he'll probably, he'll probably bring a lot. Um, and you know, uh, some, some really strong names there. And then of course, some strong names that are missing because they've gone to live like the likes of Cam Smith, Joaquin Neiman, Mito Pereira, et cetera. So, um, it would be, it would be really interesting to see, um, how it plays out. And of course, to see if the internationals can get a first win since 1998. Yeah. And you know, one thing that I, I always kind of struggle with, with, these tournaments that are, you know, annually or biannually um, that are, you know, U.S. against the world or U.S. against Europe or and in golf, but also in other sports. But is like how much we actually learn from each tournament, like like if the internationals get that that first win since 98, will that mean something about, you know, the growth of international golf or, you know, the decline of the U.S. or any of that? Or do you at the end of the day are you saying, you know, like if if, you know, like three different putts had gone a different way, then it would completely flip the narrative and like how much can we really learn from that? Um, so yeah, how do you, how do you kind of use this as a barometer and for golf more generally? Well, I think that any time that you get golf out of four day, 72 hole stroke play is a great thing for the sport. And it creates an environment in which golfers can put their personalities on display and you might see a little bit more out of like a Sam Burns or a Scotty Shuffler than you normally would in like your regular PGA tour event week in and week out. Uh, because, you know, they say that it means more to them in, you know, fighting for your team and for your country and putting on your team flags. And, and I believe them because they, you know, you can see it in the, the fiery nature in which they end up uh, performing and playing. And the same can be said for the internationals. And I think that um, at any sort of international, like if the internationals were to win, I would, I would assume that that would create a huge bump in terms of like, you know, the international audience and their viewership and their interest in the product and, um, and learning more about, those players and wanting to participate more in the week in week out then. So I, I, I would, that was my assumption. You know, I don't have the data right in this moment to back that up, but I think that it means a lot in terms of promoting the product and getting out of their regular kind of um, day in and day out. What do you think about just like team golf in general? Obviously this is something Liv has tried to make a thing. I mean, it's generally an individual mm -hmm. sport, but it's kind of fun when, when you get, you know, groups of, you get to like see the all-star team, um, you know, facing off against, against each totally. other. Um, yeah. Do, do you think this is a direction that golf can, can go in or is, is it kind of just better to have it be these isolated things? I personally love team golf. I love anything, like I mentioned that, that changes up your, your regular format or, you know, if we're doing match play or anything like that. Uh, golf is a niche sport with a very niche audience and it's probably living in a world where it needs to continue to evolve and grow the format and bring different types of people in different things that you can bet on different things that will you know be entertaining for you know for like competing against in the fall like the nfl or what whatever um might also be on TV, like we're competing for a lot of eyeballs. So I, I love the idea of team golf. I don't know how it would manifest itself in like a regular PGA tour season or what would happen with like, if there were a world where live golf and the PGA tour finally come together and they still have that, that team format, uh, this, I mean, as you know, this has been like many, many years at this point process of trying to figure out what that looks like. So, and we're, to my knowledge, not, not getting closer anytime soon. So the powers that be, I think, are trying to figure out how you integrate the, you know, quote, team golf into legitimate professional golf moving forward and what that format looks like. But for me personally, I get so excited around the Ryder Cup. It's so excited around the President's Cup. It's something that really draws you in as a golf fan. And like, it just seems like they also, like they make these insane putts. They do these insane things that they just don't do on normal weeks. So more of that, please, more of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I do wonder if there's, you know, more motivation when uh, when you're playing for a team, you know, it's like if I screw up, it's totally. not just like, I feel bad for myself. It's like, I let these other guys down. Yeah. Um, um, I do want to follow up on the the live golf negotiations, but in terms of the <laughs> players not being there, do you think that's gonna their absence will be felt in Montreal? 
Well, it's been a couple of years now. So I, I think that it's been, you know, the absence has felt, but maybe not as acutely as it, as it was like right in the beginning of, um, of all of this. I think that we've kind of moved into just like a, this is the state of things uh, approach to, to how it is. But I mean, yeah, you one must wonder what would it be like if Cam Smith was on this team or if Joaquin Neiman was on this team? Because it, it's really, it's really uh, been uh, for the internationals uh, very they've, they've lost more in that sense. Uh, so that they're, so they're having to work very hard in terms of filling in those gaps, but in terms of like, are we missing them from the product? Like, I don't know. I don't know that that's as a fan or consumer that I'm, I'm like, that's the first thing that I think of when I see this team, maybe, maybe in the first iteration when it happened, uh, two years ago. Uh, but right now I think that we've kind of moved on from, you know, having that be so top of mind, at least in this format. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, and yeah, on those negotiations, it's been more than a year, I think 15 months or so since the PGA tour and the public investment fund agreed to agree on a deal, but there's no deal. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're especially optimistic that anything's coming anytime soon. <laughs> well, I've been burned. <laughs> I've been burned, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been an interesting time to be a reporter in golf because I've turned it into like a international affairs <laughs> person, which is not why I got into sports. Um, but yeah, so we're well past a year since that framework agreement being announced. And it, um, Rory McIlroy said in his press conference a couple of days ago in Ireland that, um, you know, there's just these competing interests between players, especially, uh, that's, that's really been a major sticking point. And then of course you have the department of justice and, um, but probably, you know, things much higher in the, the world of this that we don't even know about or won't know about until somebody writes a book about it in 15 years or something like that. Um, but it, it's, um, yeah, it's certainly been an interesting thing. I will believe it when I see it, that something actually comes together and who knows if they did it, if they announce it like they did last time, it'll come out of the blue and we'll just all find out about it on CNBC. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of crazy how, I mean, I guess they were just trying to keep it under wraps and, you know, like, uh, didn't want any leaks to sink the deal or anything. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's like this big seismic thing that it seems at some point will totally change the golf world if it actually happens, but it's also just been in the background for so long now. It's like, you can kind of just forget about it in a way. Um, it almost feels like it's flipped from when, when this all started, like, because it took the players by surprise, I think a lot of them were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we didn't agree to this. What's going on. What are you people talking about to the players? I, the vibe I get more is, and maybe I'm just kind of tracking Rory McElroy's like shifting feelings on this, but the players being like, you know what? We would like to all play together. Like, could you figure out something and the the higher ups saying, well, we can't reach a deal. And now the PGA Tour has got this, you know, big source of investment, not Saudi Arabia big, but big enough to keep it going and to, you know, stay close enough cash wise to live. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like what that means in terms of like how this all shakes out, but um, the the motivation to... I mean, surely they're still talking and motivated to make a deal, but it almost feels like now it's the players who are like saying, please get this done. And, and the PGA tour saying, well, only if it's only if it works for us. Yeah. I would say, I would say that not all the players are saying, please get this done. I would say, I would say that the PGA tour probably has, I, I don't know for sure. Um, so a caveat with, but I think that the PGA Tour has probably wanted to move towards the direction of getting it done and then not been able to do so because of various things with, you know, opinions from either players or board members or what have you. And then on the lip side as well, I mean, some of those lip guys probably don't care to come back to the PGA Tour. They're, they've got their, their money. They're happy. They've got their little limited schedule. They, they're doing what they're doing. And if they come back to the PGA Tour, then they, all of a sudden they're, they're kind of you know, back into that grind of what the PGA Tour product is. So um, 
I could see a lot of them being like, you know, on the one hand, they're slow playing it with Liv. They let some of the Liv guys, not not to say that all of them, I'm sure some of them really want to come back, but some of them are like, I'm good. I'm riding off into the sunset. And then for the PGA Tour, you know, some of them are like really upset about how this played out and they want, they want people to to pay consequences for, for what they did, for what they did to the product, for what they did to them, um, for what they, you know, might've said publicly about, about the tour as they left out the door. So there's, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, yeah. I think that the players are certainly very involved in whether, whether this happens or, or not. And of course, like if you joined live, I think you had to be ready to say goodbye to the PGA tour forever because, that certainly seemed like what they were doing at the time. Um, yeah. And, um, and, you know, maybe some of them were hopeful that this would happen, but I don't think you could have, you know, anticipated it necessarily. Um, and of course, it yeah. hasn't like happened who, yet. Who knows what their motivations were? You know, some people, you know, this this whole thing is like perfect for rumors, the, you know, the rumor mill, whatever. You know, some people always like to say that, like, if certain people went to live, they thought that then that was going to help the PGA tour and live come back together faster, or, you know, they, they wanted to go to live for a bit and then, and then didn't know that they couldn't come back to the PGA tour. Or, you know, not all of them necessarily left with the pure intentions of just like buy PGA tour, see you never. Um, I think, you know, a lot of them would, would have liked the opportunity to come back sooner or have had the option to come back sooner. And this is not necessarily played out the way that maybe a lot of people thought it would. Yeah, and I also feel like Liv's negotiating position is getting weaker just because it's not been something it hasn't gotten a whole lot of viewers. I mean, they get, you know, some number of people, but the sort of the PGA Tour tournaments are still more popular by a long shot. They've got investment money. They still have enough big name golfers. Um, I think all Liv's got is a bunch of, you know, it's a very strong group of golfers. But if the PGA Tour can keep enough people to feel like you're still watching many of the best golfers in the world. You're still interested in who wins. I don't know what lives really bring into the table here at this point. Yeah. I will say that what the PGA tour has done now is created purse prizes, purse um, sizes that are largely unsustainable in an effort to compete with a uh, live that has a never ending faucet of money. Um, so at some point, the PGA Tour is going to figure out how to make that business model work. And also, you know, not for nothing, but like, this is a small niche sport. <laughs> and the, it needs all of its stars in one place playing against each other more than four times a year. The product is a tough sell as it is. And I love golf, but it's it's not, it's just not like... It's not the NFL, it's not the NBA, it's not the NHL. It's like the viewership, when you think about it, is just so much smaller compared to what an, an, an NF, a regular preseason NFL game is getting. Um, and so the, the, the investment, like the purse prize with that, it just doesn't make sense in terms of what golf stands for in the overall sports landscape. So... Um, while live might not be like taking the biggest names or, or I mean, it has in some cases um, or, you know, creating quotes such as flash. Now it is creating a, uh, an very big problem for the PGA tour that they must solve. And if it still remains fractured, I think that would be very bad for both parties and particularly the fans. Yeah. That's an excellent point. We'll leave it there. Kira Dixon. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me Ellen. Time for Front Office Sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The Miami Heat have announced stadium upgrades to the Cassia Center ahead of the 2024-25 NBA season. New features include the Fireball, the name for the new Jumbotron, which features 2,500 square feet of LED screens and 55 million pixels of digital display space, a 585% increase from the previous system, according to the team. They will also be rolling out an improved sound system, which supposedly offers a 50% increase for in-arena sound capabilities, because, you know, the one thing people always say about NBA arenas is that they're too quiet. The Heat will also have a new lighting system to brighten the floor and dim the stands for a theater-style atmosphere, and totally not to distract from the relatively empty seats during nationally televised games. 
However, the most interesting state-of-the-art renovation will come in the forms of a retractable seating system for 2100 lower bowl seats. Beyond upgrading the seats themselves, the new feature will also, quote, create a more secure pathway to locker rooms for the players. Whether this gets you excited or not, it's refreshing to see a team announce arena upgrades that focus on the playing area itself rather than the surrounding lounges, cough, cough, Buffalo Bills. That's it for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone you think would like it too. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.